Let me tell you a story. It's about a game that you can beat in less than three hours and will run you about $15. Now, now, before you mosey on down to that back button, what if I told you this game was more than worth the price? This little game is called Call of Juarez Gunslinger, and it is by far one of the most condensed video games I've seen in my life. From beginning to end, it bombards you with excellence from every angle, while also creating a highly replayable gem. And if I can't convince you with words, there's also a demo on Steam, which is pretty good too. So you remember that weird era in the early to mid 2000s where some game companies, mainly Ubisoft, were developing and publishing weird small scale titles? Yeah, I do. And this game comes from that time. On launch, it was a game from a AAA studio that cost around $15 and was initially met with some skepticism. The initial trailer didn't look great, and the Call of Juarez series was still recovering from a mediocre game that came out not too long ago called Call of Juarez The Cartel. Admittedly, those complaints were not unfounded as it is the same developer, Techland, and this game does indeed look kinda off. It kind of reminds me of the original Borderlands, with these kind of semi-realistic looking textures, with a lot of the environments having these black outlines on them. They definitely tried to go for a look here, with what presumably little time and budget they had. And while I think the characters do look fantastic, some of the environments look really weird, and it almost looks like this game needs some anti-aliasing really badly because of those outlines. But at the same time, some of these environments genuinely do look amazing, even by today's standards, which is kind of impressive considering this is a low-budget FPS from 2013. But despite those worries, what we got in the end is a game where they put their heart and soul into making this extremely short game something to remember. This game goes like this. You are Silas Greaves, an old and rugged former bounty hunter who stops by a bar for a quick rest, only to find himself regaling the patrons of the bar of his stories, as he is a very well-known bounty hunter. That's where the majority of the game's pacing and storytelling comes from. The gameplay is a representation of what the audience in the bar is imagining as he tells the stories, and as a result, the world itself will actively change around you to fit what was said. The changes can range from you being in an enclosed area and Silas saying, and out of the corner of my eye, I spotted an exit. And suddenly some rocks will shift out of the way to reveal a new tunnel, or it could be complete sections of the level that Silas was thinking about out loud, but didn't actually happen, so it rewinds it, and then you play out the level how it was supposed to happen. What we the player know about Western history, what his audience knows about their history, and what Silas recalls from his decades-old memory, there's a fun amount of back and forth on whether what Silas is saying is even true. And thankfully, they don't just make the same gag over and over again. They regularly stay creative with how they represent the misinterpretations from the audience, Silas just mumbling to himself, or skipping over and exaggerating details. My favorite is this section where Silas goes to take a piss, and while everyone is arguing over whether they believe Silas or not, in-game, you're just on a train, and it's repeating the same two train cars over and over again until he comes back to continue the story. It's a really clever gag. The same thing goes for the levels you play in. While it would have just been easy to make linear level after linear level all the same, they all try something new from one another, either focused around some kind of set piece, a way the story is told, or going through vastly different environments. So the story Silas is telling follows his life on a decades-long journey for revenge against a bandit who did him wrong, and he ends up telling all sorts of stories that are tangentially connected over the years, as he slowly works his way closer and closer to his final confrontation. It even gets awfully introspective at times towards the end, with Silas slowly coming to terms with the decisions he's made on his life. One detail of the story I like is how you never see his face. They always obscure everything above his chin with his hat and some tricky camera angles. I always thought this represented just how much he lost himself in his quest for revenge that he kind of just became a faceless murderer in his own head. It really helps that the voice acting in this game is A fucking plus. They got some serious talent for this game, with the standout being the one you hear the most for Silas Greaves. This was voiced by the late John Sagan. Where in Kansas? Abilene. Why do you ask, Ben? No reason. Was Harden as fast as Ringo? Ringo was fast, but John Wesley was as fast as the devil himself. 
Really, the only problem I have with the narration in this game is that there's actually too much of it. Not that it's a quantity over quality type deal, but because the game is actually fairly fast paced, so the characters sometimes end up narrating over combat, and you end up not being able to hear them very well. Saw Henry Plummer throw dynamite at me. And in the gates of the cemetery, I saw John Wesley Harden, just like I remembered him. So overall, the way it was told and just how the story was in general was surprisingly engaging all the way through. And as for the gameplay itself now, it is an extremely linear arcade shooter. You have a revolver, one primary that's either a shotgun or rifle, and a constant stream of shooting galleries for you to fly through. You get a mechanic called concentration, which is just bullet time that highlights enemies, making them much easier and safer to take out. You get this by killing enemies and racking up points quickly with things like headshots. The only other mechanic is Sense Death, which allows you to dodge a fatal shot, setting you back to full HP and giving you a chance to escape before it recharges. So as you could tell, it's extremely simple, and that's its biggest strength. It's all tied together by a combo counter where every enemy you kill will add a multiplier, which affects the amount of points you get from killing enemies. You can also get more points from enemies by killing them in certain ways, like headshots, shooting them through cover, doing it over a long range, and you can do multiple of these at once to squeeze out some serious points from enemies. If you happen to be in a lull with nothing to kill, you can shoot various bits of the terrain to keep your combo going. Now, before you think this might not sound interesting as you might not be into a score attack mindset, your score also dictates your XP, so by reaching higher score multipliers, you get a ton of XP and unlock some really fun perks much faster. So these perks come from one of three skill trees, and the names of these skill trees make it sound like it's something you should spec into if you want to use this specific type of weapon. But I would suggest taking a look at the perks on each tree before deciding where to put them, as many of the perks affect everything you do. Even if you want to primarily use revolvers, it would still be a very good idea to get the reload skill from the rifle tree, since you could just mash reload to jam bullets in faster, which stacks with the revolver reload speed skill. Or alternatively, just grab the concentration skills from the pistol tree and make building up and maintaining concentration so much easier for everything. Admittedly, without some of these skills, maintaining your combo can be very hard at the start. Not only that, it's not always readily apparent what you can shoot to get your combo back. Early on, you can shoot these pumpkins and chickens, which makes sense and it stands out, but in some levels, it's these random fence planks that you can shoot to keep your combo going. But once you get the combo duration skill and concentration skills, you can string your combo up so high that you just snowball from there and the game just gets silly fun. By the end, I was getting a full bar of concentration when my combo meter hit a multiple of 6, but during concentration, I gained 2 multiplier instead of 1 per kill, so every 3 kills I maxed my concentration, and when I had full concentration, I just held down the button to activate an auto-aiming headshot skill, which I could just keep going for as long as there was enemies there. So during drawn out fights, you just never reload and merc everyone you see in an instant. Now. Does it make the game insanely easy at this point, even on hard? Yes, it does. But also with this game's length, it acts as a really nice cherry on top as your story looms closer and closer to the end, and you see Silas's desperation to achieve his lifelong goal by this point. It really adds to the feeling of unbridled rage coupled with a near lifetime of skill as you just remove everyone in front of you with nothing but a flick. So the levels themselves are all just a variety of set pieces that are set up to some kind of boss fight or main encounter at the end. There might be deviations due to the storytelling taking a turn, but they'll always end up in either an ambush fight, a boss fight with a fairly average to mediocre boss that ends pretty quickly, or a duel. Now these duels are really cool because they slowly add more and more mechanics every time you do them to make them more challenging. What you have to do is keep this extremely slippery circle over the target with your mouse in order to build up focus, which helps you get your first shot out quicker. Once the enemy draws first, you have to react as fast as you can in order to get your shot off without theirs landing. Later, it adds a mechanic where you have to use A and D to keep your hand over your gun to build up speed, which makes getting the shot out even faster, since your opponents are also getting faster as well. Then you're given a forgiveness mechanic where you can dodge bullets that are fired after the draw happens. 
After that, they just slowly make the duels harder and harder by making enemies walk around instead of stand still and act faster. This all culminated into a classic Texas standoff where you have to keep watch of two different opponents. It's very satisfying, if a little hard, due to the deliberately slippery controls and how it's making you constantly focus on multiple different things at once. It's another reason this game's length is perfect, because a mechanic like this is really fun, but ultimately very limited. So by the time the game is over, you haven't really gotten tired of yet, or if you were, the last standoff is enough to give it one last hurrah. Thankfully, you actually do have an option to skip these. You'll hear a heartbeat sound, letting you know that you can draw first. If you do this, there's pretty much no way the other person has the time to react, so you can pretty much skip all these if you want. You do get a score penalty for having a dishonorable duel, however. So once you finish the story, you can return to New Game Plus to replay it with all your upgrades and see what kind of high scores you can get while blasting through the game even faster. There's also a score attack mode, which is awesome because it sections off brief portions of the levels, giving you a preset loadout and just asks you to get the highest score possible. It's extremely fun to play because of how short they can be, allowing any retries to not really be irritating in the slightest. This was a certified stress reliever while I was finishing up my degree. Really, the gunplay as a whole is fantastic once it picks up. The guns just feel great. The sound effects, especially during concentration, are so satisfying. And this game sets itself out to be so frantic with how fast it wants you to try and be. You're just sprinting around, trying to keep your score up, as you're running from enemy to enemy, hammering the reload key to reload as fast as possible, looking for objects to shoot and enemies to get special conditional kills on. With how fast you can die on hard and true west, you'd think this game would end up playing a lot slower. But if you want those high scores, you really have to bust your ass and pull off some really satisfying moves. I think the only problem I have with the combat is enemy readability. It can be a bit rough sometimes. Through this campaign, I found myself skipping over an enemy every now and then, as they could sometimes blend in with all the various outlines around them. They tried giving them all bright colors and red bandanas to make them easy to see, but it doesn't help when you run past an enemy who just happened to be crouched behind cover. The only way to get any kind of indication that there's an enemy behind you is during concentration with one of your rifle skills. And man, the music is a really nice take on the classic spaghetti western style. More often than not, I find western style music to sound a bit samey, but this game goes pretty hard with a really good soundtrack on top of all the other upsides it has. If you were to ask me if there's any game I'd call close to perfection, this would be a strong runner-up as this game is very little that it can really fuck up as it uses its limited scope so well by polishing it to a mirror sheen. It's a damn shame there hasn't been any Call of Juarez game since Gunslinger. But I suppose if there's any way to end a series, this is a pretty damn good note to go out on. Won't you spare me over till another year? What is this that I can't see With ice cold hands taking hold of me Oh, death Oh, death Won't you spare me 